Six years ago, I finally finished my schooling. I was anxious to start my career, take on the world. And like most people with their masters, I moved into my mother's basement. <laughs> 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 Don't get me wrong, living with your parents as an adult is kind of great. Except for dating. I'll say that. <laughs> but truthfully, they were the best roommates I ever had. There's always food in the fridge, they always let me borrow their car, and Sunday was clean sheet day. <laughs> only, uh, only a few times during my brief three-year stint in the basement did I get the gentle nudge to fly the coop. My reaction was, well, if I left, who's going to cut the grass or shovel the snow? I wrote my architectural thesis on laneway housing. A laneway house is a small dwelling at the rear of a property, typically in the place of a detached garage. I first learned about the idea when I was home from school for Christmas, and I was reading a news article, and it really resonated with me. I think because I was a year away from graduating, for the first time in my life, I had asked myself, where do I want to grow old? I first imagined laneway housing as a way of preserving historic homes by adding development to the site or as a, as a scheme for home ownership where I could have a mortgage helper in the backyard. Let's face it, it's getting harder and harder for people our age to buy a house. Property prices have increased faster than wages. The rules around mortgages and lending are stiffer now than ever. And not to mention, we spent most of our disposable income in our 20s on avocado toast. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping that would get a laugh. <laughs> Uh, so while I was writing my thesis, Mark was in the Gambia teaching architecture. And there's a lot of parallels between what he had learned and what I was researching. So in North America, our housing model prioritizes independence, where single-family homes are the norm. But in the rest of the world, this is generally not the case. I had the opportunity to teach architecture in the Gambia, West Africa, where I ended up learning much more than I taught. In the Gambia, the way they live is strikingly different. Families of three to four generations all live in what is known as the family compound. The family compound consists of four perimeter walls and a variety of different dwellings within the compound. Traditionally, the huts are made of thatched roofs and mud brick, which are material that come from the land and can be returned to the land with ease. Depending on the number of family members in an extended family determines the number of dwellings within the compound. At the center of the compound is the bantaba, which is a tree that the family gathers around to tell stories and to find shade. And the larger the bantaba, the longer that family has been rooted in that place. The family compound is extremely versatile and flexible, where families can change as they grow older. If a family member, for instance, has, a, has children, they can build a new house. Or if a family member passes or moves away, they can take down a house. Family members quite often live on that same piece of land for their entire lifetime. This mode of living depends on interdependence rather than independence, where family members maintain a tight relationship with each other in evolving ways throughout a lifetime. While I was there, I had the opportunity to meet with elders who told us stories and history about their neighborhoods. And it made me realize that their elders are at the top of the social order. They're revered and respected for their knowledge, their wisdom, and life experience. Whenever there's a problem in the neighborhood or the family, they're the first to be consulted to find a resolution. This made me realize that in North America, this isn't how we treat our elders. Quite often, our elders are pushed to the sidelines of society, and they're isolated and put into care facilities where they're uprooted from their communities. And it made me realize that we could do so much better. It made me ask the question, how can we better accommodate our elders within our neighborhoods? How can our houses better accommodate our changing lifestyles as we age? So I'm going to paint a picture for you of uh, the familiar pattern of settlement here in North America. So first, you move out of your parents' house, eventually. 
into an apartment, you have some kids, you buy a starter home, you have some more kids, you buy a bigger home, your kids grow up, you downsize into a condo, then eventually a care facility. I grew up in the suburbs, and it was great. Every house on my block had a kid my age. But now, when I go home to visit my folks, minus the golf carts, it's a senior's village. <laughs> the neighborhood has aged. They have to now bus kids in from the new suburbs just to fill up the schools. We like the idea of laneway housing as a way of rehabilitating these existing neighborhoods. It allows for a diversity in both the housing stock and the demographic of residents who live there. So when Matt and I first started our practice, we had this great opportunity to design and build a laneway house for a growing family. Paul, the client, uh, grew up in the main house, and he now lives there with his family. And they were trying to figure out how they could find a way to allow their in-laws to live close by. And for them, a laneway house was a good solution. And for us, it was a great opportunity to test all of our ideas. A day in the life consists of Sylvie, the granddaughter, coming home from school and going to her grandparents' place. Uh, and they take care of her until her parents come home. And in the evenings, they share a family dinner together. And in the summers, they have dinner in the courtyard between the two houses. And it just so happens that Paul, when he was a kid, planted a tree and now that tree is a big old growth pine that in a sense is the family's bantaba. For Jill and Paul, building this laneway house allowed them to have some assistance raising their child and gave them peace of mind knowing that their in-laws live close by, but not too close. And the grandparents, when they were first thinking about moving into this little laneway house, they were really worried about how they could downsize and what they were going to do with all that stuff. But once they moved in, they realized they don't really need all that stuff because they can share a lot of the stuff with their family. So what Mark just described to you is what we like to call the laneway life cycle. And you can imagine the flexibility in this property and how it could support this family in all stages of life. One day, I imagine this loop where Jill and Paul live in the laneway house and their daughter raises their family in the main dwelling. So I, too, am an alley dweller. This is where I live with my family, and this is where we are in the laneway life cycle. So I tend to romanticize what it's like to live in the alley, but I don't think I'm that far off. The quaint, narrow streets remind me of the gravel roads in European towns. As the keeper of the alley, I sprinkle <laughs> wildflower seeds along the overgrown edges. The fragmented setting of the garages, power poles, and fences creates a roughness, forcing vehicles and people to move much slower. <laughs> the deep pocket of the entryway frames our front yard, as well as provides an auxiliary parking stall for guests. So this is a 700-square-foot, two-bedroom, Sorry, two and a half bedroom laneway house. <laughs> 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 and I love living here. Uh, I think what this project does is puts an emphasis on smaller, meaningful spaces over square footage. So I'm a laneway dweller as well, where I live with my partner Maria, and it's great. It allows us to live inner city affordably. And we share the space with our compound companion. Uh, Brenda. And Brenda and us, we're not family, but we look out for each other. For instance, whenever Brenda goes away and she needs somebody to take care of her place in her yard, we do that for her, and she does the same for us. When we designed the laneway house, we did it with interdependence in mind. For instance, the kitchen faces right onto the alley, which are both very public spaces. And so whenever I'm washing dishes at the sink, I'm constantly interacting with the neighbors and the dog walkers as they walk by. And our living room has a big double door that faces onto the shared courtyard, and we're constantly ru running into each other Brenda, with, with Brenda. So Matt and I, we're living the laneway house dream. And uh, so far, so good. It's made us realize that this idea actually works, and it's a viable way of adding diversity to our housing stock within our communities. 
So from my thesis to Mark's experience in the Gambia, we're always trying to create environments that can support changing lifestyles. And I think we found a good idea in how we can grow old. I would like to leave you with one final note, especially to all you baby boomers. Be nice to your kids. <laughs> Let them live in your basement for as long as possible. Because <laughs> chances are, one day, you will live in their backyard. Thank you. <laughs>